and welcome to Bite Sized Audio on YouTube. I'm Simon Stanhope, actor, audiobook narrator, and curator of this channel. On the channel, you can hear my narrations, more than a hundred to date and more to come, of classic short stories, mostly from the Victorian and Edwardian eras, including vintage ghost stories, detective stories, and other classic tales of mystery and suspense. To accompany the narrations, I've put a short profile of the authors in the video description, as well as some general background notes on the stories for those who'd like to know more. If you enjoy this content, please hit subscribe, like, share, leave a comment if you'd like to, and thank you for listening. The Secret Sin of Septimus Brope by Saki Who and what is Mr. Brope? demanded the aunt of Clovis, suddenly. Mrs. Riversedge, who had been snipping off the heads of defunct roses, and thinking of nothing in particular, sprang hurriedly to mental attention. She was one of those old-fashioned hostesses who consider that one ought to know something about one's guests— and that the something ought to be to their credit. "'I believe he comes from Leighton Buzzard,' she observed, by way of preliminary explanation. "'In these days of rapid and convenient travel,' said Clovis, who was dispersing a colony of greenfly with visitations of cigarette smoke, "'to come from Leighton Buzzard does not necessarily denote any great strength of character. It might only mean mere restlessness.' Now, if he had left it under a cloud, or as a protest against the incurable and heartless frivolity of its inhabitants, that would tell us something about the man and his mission in life. "'What does he do?' pursued Mrs. Troyle, magisterially. "'He edits the Cathedral Monthly,' said her hostess, "'and he's enormously learned about memorial brasses and transepts, and the influence of Byzantine worship on modern liturgy, and all those sorts of things,' Perhaps he is just a little bit heavy, and immersed in one range of subjects, but it takes all sorts to make a good house-party, you know. You don't find him too dull, do you?' "'Dullness I could overlook,' said the aunt of Clovis. "'What I cannot forgive is his making love to my maid.' "'My dear Mrs. Troyle,' gasped the hostess, "'What an extraordinary idea! I assure you, Mr. Brope would not dream of doing such a thing.' "'His dreams are a matter of indifference to me. For all I care, his slumbers may be one long indiscretion of unsuitable erotic advances, in which the entire servants' hall may be involved. But in his waking hours he shall not make love to my maid. It's no use arguing about it. I'm firm on the point.' "'But you must be mistaken,' persisted Mrs. Riversedge. "'Mr. Brope would be the last person to do such a thing.' "'He is the first person to do such a thing, as far as my information goes. And if I have any voice in the matter, he certainly shall be the last. Of course, I am not referring to respectably intentioned lovers.' Well, "'I simply cannot think that a man who writes so charmingly and informingly about transepts and Byzantine influences would behave in such an unprincipled manner,' said Mrs. Riversedge. "'What evidence have you that he's doing anything of the sort? I don't want to doubt your word, of course, but we mustn't be too ready to condemn him unheard, must we?' "'Whether we condemn him or not, he has certainly not been unheard.' He has the room next to my dressing-room, and on two occasions, when I dare say he thought I was absent, I have plainly heard him announcing through the wall, "'I love you, Flory. Those partition walls upstairs are very thin. One could almost hear a watch ticking in the next room.' "'Is your maid called Florence?' "'Her name is Florinda.' Oh, "'What an extraordinary name to give a maid!' 
I did not give it to her. She arrived in my service already christened. <laughs> what I mean is, said Mrs. Rivers Edge, that when I get maids with unsuitable names, I call them Jane. They soon get used to it. An excellent plan, said the aunt of Clovis, coldly. Unfortunately, I have got used to being called Jane myself. It happens to be my name. She cut short Mrs. Rivers Edge's flood of apologies by abruptly remarking, The question is not whether I am to call my maid Florinda, but whether Mr. Brope is to be permitted to call her Florrie. I am strongly of opinion that he shall not. He may have been repeating the words of some song, said Mrs. Rivers Edge, hopefully. There are lots of those sorts of silly refrains with girls' names, she continued, turning to Clovis as a possible authority on the subject. You mustn't call me Mary. I shouldn't think of doing so, Clovis assured her. In the first place, I have always understood that your name was Henrietta, and then I hardly know you well enough to take such a liberty. I mean, there's a song with that refrain, hurriedly explained Mrs. Rivers Edge, and there's Rhoda, Rhoda, kept a pagoda, and Maisie is a daisy, and heaps of others. Certainly it doesn't sound like Mr. Brope to be singing such songs, but I think we ought to give him the benefit of the doubt. I had already done so, said Mrs. Troyle, until further evidence came my way. She shut her lips with the resolute finality of one who enjoys the blessed certainty of being implored to open them again. "'Further evidence!' exclaimed her hostess. "'Do tell me. "'As I was coming upstairs after breakfast, "'Mr. Brope was just passing my room. "'In the most natural way in the world, "'a piece of paper dropped out of a packet that he held in his hand "'and fluttered to the ground just at my door. "'I was going to call out to him. "'You've dropped something. "'And then, for some reason, I held back "'and didn't show myself till he was safely in his room.' You see, it occurred to me that I was very seldom in my room just at that hour, and that Florinda was almost always there, tidying up things about that time. So I picked up that innocent-looking piece of paper. Mrs. Troyle paused again, with the self-applauding air of one who has detected an asp lurking in an apple charlotte. Mrs. Rivers Edge snipped vigorously at the nearest rose-bush incidentally decapitating a Viscountess Folkestone that was just coming into bloom. "'What was on the paper?' she asked. "'Just the words, in pencil, "'I love you, Florrie,' and then, underneath, crossed out with a faint line, but perfectly plain to read, "'Meet me in the garden by the yew.' Oh, "'There is a yew-tree at the bottom of the garden,' admitted Mrs. Rivers Edge. "'At any rate, he appears to be truthful,' commented Clovis. "'To think that a scandal of this sort should be going on under my roof,' said Mrs. Rivers Edge indignantly. "'I wonder why it is that scandal seems so much worse under a roof,' observed Clovis. "'I've always regarded it as a proof of the superior delicacy of the cat tribe, that it conducts most of its scandals above the slates.' "'Now I come to think of it,' resumed Mrs. Rivers Edge, "'there are things about Mr. Brope that I've never been able to account for. "'His income, for instance, he only gets two hundred a year as editor of the Cathedral Monthly, "'and I know that his people are quite poor, and he hasn't any private means. "'Yet he manages to afford a flat somewhere in Westminster, "'and he goes abroad to Bruges and those sorts of places every year.' and always dresses well, and gives quite nice luncheon parties in the season. You can't do all that on two hundred a year, can you? "'Does he write for any other papers?' queried Mrs. Troyle. "'No. You see, he specialises so entirely on liturgy and ecclesiastical architecture that his field is rather restricted. He once tried the sporting and dramatic, with an article on church edifices in famous fox-hunting centres, but it wasn't considered of sufficient general interest to be accepted. No, I don't see how he can support himself in his present style merely by what he writes. 
Perhaps he sells spurious transepts to American enthusiasts, suggested Clovis. How could you sell a transept? said Mrs. Rivers Edge. Such a thing would be impossible. Whatever he may do to eke out his income, interrupted Mrs. Troyle, he is certainly not going to fill his leisure moments by making love to my maid. Of course not, agreed her hostess. That must be put a stop to at once. But I don't quite know what we ought to do. You might put a barbed wire entanglement round the yew tree as a precautionary measure, said Clovis. I don't think that the disagreeable situation that has arisen is improved by flippancy, said Mrs. Rivers Edge. A good maid is a treasure. I am sure I don't know what I shall do without Florinda, admitted Mrs. Troyle. She understands my hair. I've long ago given up trying to do anything with it myself. I regard one's hair as I regard husband's. As long as one is seen together in public, one's private divergences don't matter. Surely that was the luncheon gong. Septimus Brope and Clovis had the smoking-room to themselves after lunch. The former seemed restless and preoccupied, the latter quietly observant. "'What is a lorry?' asked Septimus suddenly. "'I don't mean the thing on wheels. Of course I know what that is. But isn't there a bird with a name like that, the larger form of a lorikeet?' "'I fancy it's a lorry with one R,' said Clovis, lazily. "'In which case it's no good to you.' Septimus Brope stared in some astonishment. How, "'How do you mean, no good to me?' he asked, with more than a trace of uneasiness in his voice. "'Won't rhyme with Florrie,' explained Clovis, briefly. Septimus sat upright in his chair, with unmistakable alarm on his face. "'How did you find out? I mean, how did you know I was trying to get a rhyme to Florrie?' he asked sharply. "'I didn't know,' said Clovis. "'I only guessed. "'When you wanted to turn the prosaic lorry of commerce "'into a feathered poem flitting through the verdure of a tropical forest, "'I knew you must be working up a sonnet, "'and Florrie was the only female name that suggested itself as rhyming with lorry.' "'Septimus still looked uneasy. "'I believe you know more,' he said. "'Clovis laughed quietly, but said nothing.' "'How much do you know?' Septimus asked, desperately. "'The yew tree in the garden,' said Clovis. "'There! I felt certain I'd dropped it somewhere. "'But you must have guessed something before. "'Look here, you have surprised my secret. "'You won't give me away, will you? "'It is nothing to be ashamed of, "'but it wouldn't do for the editor of the Cathedral Monthly "'to go in openly for that sort of thing, would it?' "'Well, I suppose not,' admitted Clovis. "'You see,' continued Septimus, "'I get quite a decent lot of money out of it. "'I could never live in the style I do "'on what I get as editor of the Cathedral Monthly.' Clovis was even more startled than Septimus had been earlier in the conversation, but he was better skilled in repressing surprise. "'Do you mean to say you get money out of Florrie? he asked. "'Not out of Florrie, as yet,' said Septimus. "'In fact, I don't mind saying that I'm having a good deal of trouble over Florrie. "'But there are a lot of others.' Clovis's cigarette went out. "'This is very interesting,' he said slowly. And then, with Septimus Brope's next words, illumination dawned on him. "'There are heaps of others. For instance, "'Cora with the lips of coral, you and I will never quarrel. "'That was one of my earliest successes, and it still brings me in royalties. "'And then there is Esmeralda, when I first beheld her, "'and Fair Teresa, how I love to please her. "'Both of those have been fairly popular. "'And there is one rather dreadful one,' continued Septimus, "'flushing deep carmine, which has brought me in more money than any of the others.' "'Lively little Lucy, with her naughty nay retrousse. Oh, "'Of course, I loathe the whole lot of them. 
In fact, I'm rapidly becoming something of a woman-hater under their influence, but I can't afford to disregard the financial aspect of the matter. And at the same time, you can understand that my position as an authority on ecclesiastical architecture and liturgical subjects would be weakened, if not altogether ruined, if it once got about that I was the author of Cora with the Lips of Coral, and all the rest of them. Clovis had recovered sufficiently to ask, in a sympathetic, if rather unsteady, voice, what was the special trouble with Florry. "'I can't get her into lyric shape. Try as I will,' said Septimus mournfully. "'You see, one has to work in a lot of sentimental, sugary compliment with a catchy rhyme, and a certain amount of personal biography or prophecy.' They've all of them got to have a long string of past successes recorded about them, or else you've got to foretell blissful things about them and yourself in the future. For instance, there is dainty little girly Mavis, she is such a rarer Avis, all the money I can save is, all to be for Mavis mine. It goes to a sickening namby-pamby waltz tune, and for months nothing else was sung and hummed in Blackpool and other popular centres. This time Clovis's self-control broke down badly. <laughs> "'Please excuse me,' he gurgled. "'But I can't help it when I remember the awful solemnity of that article of yours that you so kindly read us last night on the Coptic Church in its relation to early Christian worship.' Septimus groaned. Oh, "'You see how it would be,' he said, as soon as people knew me to be the author of that miserable, sentimental twaddle, all respect for the serious labours of my life would be gone. I dare say I know more about memorial brasses than any one living. In fact, I hope one day to publish a monograph on the subject. But I should be pointed out everywhere, as the man whose ditties were in the mouths of seaside minstrels along the entire coastline of our island home— can you wonder that I positively hate Florry all the time that I'm trying to grind out sugar-coated rhapsodies about her? Well, why not give free play to your emotions and be brutally abusive? An uncomplimentary refrain would have an instant success as a novelty, if you were sufficiently outspoken. Oh, I've never thought of that, said Septimus, and I'm afraid I couldn't break away from the habit of fulsome adulation— and suddenly change my style. "'You needn't change your style in the least,' said Clovis. "'Merely reverse the sentiment, and keep to the inane phraseology of the thing. "'If you'll do the body of the song, I'll knock off the refrain, "'which is the thing that principally matters, I believe. "'I shall charge half shares in the royalties, "'and throw in my silence as to your guilty secret. "'In the eyes of the world, you shall still be the man who has devoted his life to the study of transepts and Byzantine ritual. Only sometimes, in the long winter evenings, when the wind howls drearily down the chimney and the rain beats against the windows, I shall think of you as the author of Cora with the Lips of Coral. Of course, if, in sheer gratitude at my silence, you like to take me for a much-needed holiday to the Adriatic— or somewhere equally interesting, paying all expenses, I shouldn't dream of refusing. Later in the afternoon, Clovis found his aunt and Mrs. Riversedge indulging in gentle exercise in the Jacobean garden. "'I've spoken to Mr. Brope about F,' he announced. "'How splendid of you! What did he say?' came in a quick chorus from the two ladies. "'He was quite frank and straightforward with me when he saw that I knew his secret,' said Clovis. "'And it seems that his intentions were quite serious, if slightly unsuitable. "'I tried to show him the impracticability of the course that he was following. "'He said he wanted to be understood, and he seemed to think that Florinda would excel in that requirement. "'But I pointed out that there were probably dozens of delicately nurtured, pure-hearted young English girls,' who would be capable of understanding him, while Florinda was the only person in the world who understood my aunt's hair. That rather weighed with him, for he's not really a selfish animal, if you take him in the right way, and when I appealed to the memory of his happy childish days, 
spent amid the daisied fields of Leighton Buzzard. I suppose daisies do grow there. He was obviously affected. Anyhow, he gave me his word that he would put Florinda absolutely out of his mind, and he has agreed to go for a short trip abroad, as the best distraction for his thoughts. I am going with him as far as Ragusa. If my aunt should wish to give me a really nice scarf-pin, to be chosen by myself, as a small recognition of the very considerable service I had done her, I shouldn't dream of refusing. I'm not one of those who think that, because one is abroad, one can go about dressed anyhow. A few weeks later, in Blackpool, and places where they sing, the following refrain held undisputed sway. How you bore me, Flory, with those eyes of vacant blue. You'll be very sorry, Flory, if I marry you. Though I'm easy going, Flory, this I swear is true. I'll throw you down a quarry, Flory, if I marry you. You've been listening to a bite-sized audiobook, read by me, Simon Stanhope. If you enjoy these stories and would like to help me to keep producing new content, you can find links in the video description to my Patreon page, or to buy me a coffee. Another way to support me is through my Bandcamp page, bitesizedaudio.bandcamp.com, where you can hear my narrations of many more classic short stories, and you can also purchase and download them to keep. This recording is copyright Bite-Sized Audio 2024. Thank you for listening.